Thank you. I brought a sticky note because uh, I got a difficult task here. I got a, people ask me to talk about the future as it emerges, which is a challenging topic. So I'm going to talk about the neuroscience of leadership. Uh, I want to start off not in the future, but in the past, so basically going back to the year 1955. You know, there was a year that Einstein died. Einstein was just mentioned uh, by my previous speaker. You know, he was cremated, but his brain was not. Thomas Harvey, the pathologist, took out his brain, basically, to study uh, the genius, you know, of an inspirational, in a way, scientific leader, a true genius. So he took it out, he moved it across country, wherever he went, uh, relocated. Um, the thing is, he didn't find that much. Uh, it was at the time when they had no real means to study it, you know, so he was observing. There were no big differences. In fact, Einstein's brain's brain was a little bit smaller than the average brain it turned out to be. And, and later on, he um, basically he took photos at the time of the patho uh, you know, um, when, when he took out his brain. And then later on in 1999, 45 years later, they actually looked at those and um, concluded that the only part that was bigger in his brain was his parietal lobe. The parietal lobe, for those who are not familiar with uh, the brain, is the part in the brain that is responsible for our visual and spatial thinking. And Einstein himself had said you know, earlier many times that he thought more in images than in words, which is interesting. Um, Let's move from Princeton, New Jersey, from an Ivy League institution to another Ivy League institution to uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania. Just come back from Wharton, where a couple of uh, friends and colleagues have just run and concluded a neuroscientific st scientific study of MBA students. So they put students, MBA students, in a scanner, and basically ask them to deal with a moral issue. They were trying to look into the differences in terms of risk decisions and you know, those students who would actually come up and make moral decisions. So what is the trade of in risk and moral decision making? A very timely topic. Uh, the hope is to find more generic patterns of, or you could say neural pathways of what actually makes uh, managerial decision making responsible, and which is of course a timely topic. As you all know, we are in the middle of a deep crisis. The deep crisis was preceded by Big business scandals, initially, I would argue. Just take Enron as an example. Enron, WorldCom, all these big scandals, where risk-taking of top managers was probably the single biggest cause of the failures in the end. You know, led to destruction of thousands of jobs, it, to destruction of pension funds, or companies. Arthur Anderson basically collapsed just because of Enron. So it is a very timely topic. and. Um, what we see now is that, you know, in a way, also the financial crisis of 2008 was due to a managerial, excessive managerial risk taking. So the hope is with neuroscientific methods to actually discover some kind of neural pathways uh, when it comes to responsible decision making. Not an easy task, but a fascinating one. What is not surprising then, I think, if you look at the surveys out there, is that the trust in business leaders is at an all-time low. There are surveys out that basically say that only Every fifth person or so asks trust in business leaders. There are only two professions with score words, which, is, uh, which are lawyers and uh, tabloid journalists. So, you know, at the same time, while trust is at an all-time low, we have a lot more expectations as to business leaders' responsibilities. We want them to engage in social issues. We want them to address environmental issues. Um, you know, we want them to do more, to do better which leads to a somewhat ironic situation. We expect business leaders to do better, to do more, but we don't really trust them to do so. What it highlights, I think, is that leaders are important. Leaders do matter. Leaders do have a huge impact on our lives. Uh, so it is important to understand how they tick, what kind of decisions they make, and why they are tuned to a certain decision and not to another. And so, you know, neuroscience, in a way, and that's our biggest driver, I think, in this study, is we, we can really under, can help us to understand what is actually happening in the brains, in the minds of leaders. I often have a task that I give my students uh, in courses. I ask them to study a leader of their choice. You know, just pick one leader that you find inspiring, a prime example of, of good leadership. 
take a guess of who they pick. Most of them will not pick famous business leaders. Not even MBA students, you know, notoriously business-friendly MBA students pick business leaders. They go for social impact leaders. They like to study Nelson Mandela, uh, Mohamed Yunus, both very inspirational you know, social impact leaders, change makers, uh, in a way, in their own domains. They look at people like Paul Farmer, a physician. Um, he's a head of uh, social medicine and global health department at uh, Harvard Medical School. Someone who has taken on the fight against Big Pharma to fight, uh, you know, cure the world, he says. Basically fight what is wrong in the world. People like Douglas Tompkins, the founder of the North Face. Douglas Tompkins is now the world's leading environmental activist, the world's biggest, biggest private landowner, actually. He is buying up all these spaces in Patagonia and other places around the world just to preserve them for future generations. This is inspiring. But they also look at people like uh, young social business leaders, you know, the, the makers. Uh, of this world right now, uh, Blake Mikoski, founder of Tom's Shoes. You, know, you buy one pair of shoes, you donate one to a person in need. What a great idea, what a neat idea. So I think my take on it is the leaders that we admire are the leaders that inspire, the ones that have empathy, care about the future generations, about the state around them, that actually want to make a difference. How neuroscience can help us is then an interesting question. I think we have seen a, a surge of, of interest uh, in neuroscience over the past decade or so, and the blending actually of organizational research and uh, you know, neuroscience methods. So the hope is to find pathways, patterns, which help us to understand why some leaders are being more admired on the side of the followers, so to speak, but also what makes them different. You know, are they wired up differently? Is there something special around it? Yeah. So we have seen this, this, this huge development in terms of what is happening in neuroscience as well as in organizational research. Uh, imaging technologies such as fMRI scans have given us much more opportunities and tools to actually capture what is going on in the brains. You don't have to wait for somebody to die until we can do it. We can just actually look at what is happening in real time, which is great. This is uh, you know, one of the big tools that we have. It's very expensive, but it's great to have. So what do we know so far, and where do we want to take this, this neuroscience uh, of leadership? Um, let me share a couple of thoughts on this, and you know, let me put out one caveat. I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm not going to delve into any special terms here, but I'm just going to run quickly through how all this is relevant. Um, if you look at our brain, then what neuroscience tells us is basically that it is the most complex natural system that we have in the whole universe. So we're far from being able to fully understand what is actually happening in our brain, let alone the brain of leaders. <laughs> you know, it's an intricate web of billions of neurons. These neurons are connected to each other, they fire off. Yeah? They also fire off when we meet each other. That's sort of interesting part. This is why we are intricately motivated to actually engage with others. These neurons form certain patterns, sort of uh, networks of uh, patterns, which are actually they're not just very specialized in a certain region, but they're also connected to each other. All of this, in the end, emerges as what uh, Sebastian Sung, a MIT neuroscientist, calls the connectome. What is a connectome? A connectome is a very specific individual wiring that they all have. You know, we all wired in the same way. This is similar. We all have similar brains, some slightly smaller, some slightly bigger, doesn't matter. But we, are, we have a very individual connectome that is the composite of the individual neural, neurons that fire against each other, how these neurons are composed then in sort of specific local networks and how this all leads to a specific wiring in our brains. Right? And this, this sort of connectome is constantly responding to external influences, to our meetings, to, to others. So this is what happens basically in the brain. Through neurotechnologies, we are now able to actually assess what is happening. Right? We can put people in scanners and look, take them into fMRI scans and do that, but we can also use EEG methodology, which is uh, wireless. The thing that you can see here on, on the photo, this is actually what we d have done in, in SR last year and with our MBA students. We just um, you know, wired them up, 
basically with wireless EEG units, electroencephalogram. These units are connected to a laptop or a tablet and basically transmits the information. So the great thing about this setting is you can actually take real people, take, put them in a real setting and assess what they are doing. You know? fMRI would be nice and neat, we would much better pictures, but it's hard to take five people and put them in tubes and have them converse with each other, right? That might be possible in the future, it's not now. So what we do is actually, we wire them up, we can look at the brain, we connect the electrodes, and then they start discussing, much in a board meeting, much in a real-life board meeting, on a specific business issue, right? A preceding study by colleagues and co-founders of the Neuroscience of Leadership Project in Arizona uh, uncovered something which is very interesting. You know, they've run this first study um, and they made even the Wall Street Journal's uh, front page at that time. And what they found is, is a very interesting pattern. They found in the group of leaders that they studied that the ones who had more coherence in the brain were the ones that were sort of the ones that are perceived as, as visionary, as inspirational. So you know, going back to the ones that I mentioned earlier, the Nelson Mandela's and so on, you know, these people apparently have more coherence in their brain. Their brains are much better connected. Right? Different measures of coherence in the brain, but the different areas in the brains where these neurons are composed in functional regions, these are much, much better connected than, say, in task-driven people. Managers who are just focusing on a specific task. You know, the more inspirational ones who display more coherence in the brain are the ones who engage also much better with others because they have higher levels of empathy. They display more emotional and social intelligence. Right? These are the right hemisphere people, so to speak. You know, this is, you know, you're all familiar with the left and the right hemisphere, but you can actually literally show what is happening in the brain just by... Um, assessing the dynamics, and you'll see, in terms of specific measure, that the ones that are perceived as more inspirational and visionary by the followers, by others, are the ones who also have more coherence, more connection among these. This is what you can sh see here uh, on the left part, on the front page here of the Wall Street Journal, and this is the person that actually had less coherence. You see a lot less activity. Red, the, co the activity is the red part. Right? So, you know, very interesting findings in that sense. What it means, though, is that, you know, as we go forward, we can actually distinguish between those who are more visionary, more inspirational, how they interact with others, and, and ultimately what this means in, in, in going forward. What we did, in addition to this, in terms of, you know, people who, who do have a shared vision and, and, you know, come up with a really good solution, you'll find in that many of the leadership tasks today require shared solutions, shared leadership, so to speak. So we put an emphasis on, in our study on, on shared leadership. You know? The team, much like in a board meeting, is discussing a specific task, and we have some interesting findings. You know, the first findings so far coming out of this is that, first of team engagement, the extent to which this team is really engaged is relevant for the team outcome. It means for the effectiveness of the, the, the sort of validity of the solution. It means, you know, the better the team is connected to each other, the better they engage, and they can show it, you can show it in their brains, the better the solution. One thing. Second thing is leadership matters. Yes, it does matter. The more we have, the more visible a leadership is, the, uh, the more active in a way the team connects uh, around this leadership, the, the better the solution, the outcome. Uh, vice versa, if you look at teams who are kind of disconnected, you can actually show in the brains of people once you know, the non-leader, perceived non-leader speaks up, that their systems shut down, basically. The attention span, you know, shut down. Literally, you can, all, you can she show all this in the uh, brain. So the hope is, you know, eventually to come up with some kind of measure for team neurodynamics, which would be very valid for leaders to go on in terms of taking that information to either know how what to do in order to engage others, but also for leaders to, to be developed in a, in a, into a better space. You know, we'll be looking forward to a responsible leadership measure, a neural pathway of responsible leadership, so to speak. The way you could do this development is basically in two ways. You can do it traditionally, just to traditional leadership programs, you know, taking people out into the woods and you know, get their grip around environmental issues, perhaps. 
Or you can use neurofeedback technologies. Now, what is neurofeedback? For those who are non-specialists, neurofeedback is basically using the same technology, but giving people feedback towards a certain direction, into a desired state of being. Now, some of you might say, wow, you know, you're going to mess with people's brains. And you know, whenever we get this question, we say, of course. You know, we're going to give you electroshocks. We're going to drill little holes in your brain. And, and, you know, this, and we're going to rewire you. This is not how it's, go how it's going to happen. Um, because there's th three things to keep in mind, you have to keep in mind. First off, I can force you to change, but you will not change if you're not willing to do so. You know, yeah, this is your sort of internal resistance that you have. You, you have to be open and willing. Psychologists call this environmental, or well, basically developmental readiness. If you're not ready, you will not be able to change. Second thing is, this change needs to be reinforced throughout action and interaction. This is why neurofeedback, you know, usually used in medical context, can treat attention deficit disorder, takes a number of sessions. You know, it takes at least 10 sessions to be somewhat sustainable. So it takes interaction. And the third one, which is perhaps most interesting, is obviously a non-invasive method. We're not going to drill any holes in anybody. But it's totally, uh, you don't even feel it. All it does is basically measures the energy. And once you use neurofeedback, it kind of feeds back certain impulses to your brain. But much of these effects, up to 70%, as a neuroscientist recently told you, you can um, achieve with meditation, just through simple meditation. Our brain is changing every day. That is what our brain is wired to do. You know, we change. If you drink too much, your brain changes. You know, your neurons die away. That's a you know, natural consequence of too much drinking. Um, now, it's no surprise then if that the, the Dalai Lama is actually quite, quite fond of neuroscience. He's uh, uh, you know, a big favorite because the Buddhists rewire their brains every day through mindfulness exercises, through, through meditation. This is what they do. Right? So I want to conclude with, with one thought then, which is basically, you know, this is just a little illustration of uh, teams being on the same wavelength. Where literally, you can see how the teams actually operate on the same wavelength. I want to close. I started with Einstein. I want to close with Einstein. Einstein had another interesting quote. He said at one point, you know, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. So I think our hope is that we will find through the research that we do and through the activities that we do, leaders who will actually help to build a better world. We have the imagination to do that and convince others and sort of develop others um, who are locked in their left hemisphere to do the same. Thank you.